because all the people that ever come looking for things at the door of my house always are complaining that the bottle stores are closed and they have no wine. So I suppose it's the, uh, it was the uh, premonition in Jesus' time of the lockdown that was to come. They had no wine. I was reading the other day of, a, of an experiment that, um, that, that some scientists conducted and put a whole lot of fleas, fleas in a jar, and then screwed the jar closed and watched intently the behavior of those fleas. And the fleas jumped around as fleas do, and they knocked their heads on the lid, and they knocked their heads on the side, and they knocked themselves against each other, and then all the Jumping and knocking around and went on for days and days and days. And then the scientists took the lid off. And they noticed that none of the fleas jumped out of the grass. None of the fleas grasped the new moment, the new possibility they were being offered. But instead, Live with the limitation that would be imposed on them. They accepted and took for granted that that limitation was there forever. And I thought of that because when I thought of today's feast, I wasn't thinking so much of this gospel, I was thinking of that incredible gospel passage that we have in Mark. Um, in the very beginning of Mark, Mark chapter 2, where um, Jesus is preaching in a house. You might remember the story now. Jesus is preaching in a house, and he's been preaching we are told, for many days. And then the scribes and the Pharisees, who were out to get him, full of the sacred space, and the sick man, the paralytic, couldn't get in. You remember that? And his friends, not him, his friends loaded him onto a stretcher, removed the roof. You remember that? And they lowered him into Jesus' mouth. And that's what I've been thinking of as I've thought of this day. Because there are almost several wonderful points that emerge from that for all of us who come into moments like this with our sickness carrying the burden of our years, carrying the burden of diagnoses that have uh, gone wrong, and we all have a sense of <coughs> needing something from God. And not only those of us who are here, but today we really have the names of so many of our friends and family and sisters and brothers whose names are on that box on the altar, and they with us in a wonderful way, in a vibrant community of faith this morning. But to get back to that lovely story in Mark of the Evening, <coughs> to get back to it, three things I think I want us to think about today. The four men, the four people, the friends of of, of, of the sick man had to do one thing. They had to persuade the sick man to leave the space that had become comfortable for him, the suffering, the environment of suffering, the lid that had been put over him, think of the fleas, and they had to say to him, don't settle for this because there is another Possibility. Don't limit the possibilities of God and the way God works in your life when you are sick or when you are hurting or when you are in pain or when you are anxious or when the diagnosis isn't looking good for you. Don't limit the ways of God to where you are at now. Are you with me? <laughs> so sometimes we limit and say, well, there's nothing I can do. And there's very little we can do, but sometimes in sickness and in pain and in difficulty and in grief, there are also options for us. And they were saying to him, let us take you into the presence of one who can change your perspective. And in a way, 
That's what we're asking in this Eucharist today. We say, God, we're sick, we're old, we're hurting, we're in pain, we've uh, received diagnosis from doctors that we would not in a hundred years have wanted to hear, but we're sitting with them. And we don't want to be limited by it. We don't want to believe that there are no possibilities, that there's no potential, that there are no options in our lives. And so the first point of that story is that God is at work exceedingly compassionately meeting us in the places of our need. But sometimes we have to shift gear. Might not be that, you know, your children are going to pick you up and take you onto a roof of a double story house and lower you through the roof. It might not be that. It might not be something spectacular or, or, or mind-blowing. It just might be that your mind and heart, my mind and heart, has to shift into another place so that we can receive the touch of God. Are we together? That is the healing God often offers us. To move out of our places that we're in, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and to allow others to take us into a different place of encounter. And so I just ask you to hold on to that today. To hold on to that today. And then it links a little bit, if you think about it, with the first point I made in the introduction, that part of what the words is about is to say to us, behold your mother. What was Jesus asking John in the place of his suffering? To change the location of his perspective. To change how he looked at relationships so that something better could be uh, could emerge. Second point. When those friends lowered their friend, they had an expectation that the you know Jesus' reputation had now been all over the place, that he was a healer, that he was able to do great things, he was a miracle worker, and, and, and he could do this. And so they all basically, look, you know, there's a chance for you. He can heal you. And so they went through this extraordinary effort to bring their friend into God's presence, into Jesus' presence. And they had the expectation, we know from the language in which the story is written, they had the expectation that their friend would be healed physically. Now, in the end, he was, but that's not where Jesus met him. The incredible conversation that takes place has Jesus say, Your sins are forgiven you. Now, that's not what the friends had probably expected here. They had expected to hear what came later get up, take up your, um, your stature, and walk. But Jesus makes the point that healing is not about the physical healing. Sometimes it happens. But most times Jesus is at work dealing with the inner stuff that we carry in our lives that prevent us from feeling the emotional, the psychological, the spiritual healing that is always on offer from the Lord. And I think there would be few of us who would deny that part of what keeps us under, in the jaw and not springing out of the jaw is that we carry all sorts of stuff in our lives. Anxiety, hurt, lack of gratitude, bad relationships that we say we deal with the heart and that are festering. And those are the things that Jesus is talking about to that man. Not necessarily about whether he killed his mother in law. But there's stuff going on inside of you that I want to deal with if you're going to be able to take advantage of all the other possibilities I have. 
And so the second thing I want to ask us to think about and to pray over in our hearts today is that you know, we might have come from healing, those who are watching us on live streaming, and those whose names are in our box on the altar might have come and they're desperate to have that physical healing. But Jesus is also asking you today, every one of us, to deal with the stuff that's going on inside of us before you can do anything. It's also interesting because the social commentators, you see, I didn't have a chance to preach off and so now I'm preaching long today, even though they were supposed to have mass over in 45 minutes, um, according to the rules, and you know, um, when you were, people who are sick, they can't sit still for so long, but, uh, you know, it's here, yeah. Um, the, um, normally, you might not have known this, because I didn't know it until I saw it in the commentary. The roof was only open when they wanted to lower a coffin into a crowded place or take the dead body out of a crowded room. And then it was easier to just go through the roof. And isn't it wonderful that in this story, Jesus changes the narrative of sickness from one of death being the way we see sickness to one of restoring life in its fullness as being the possibility that comes out of sickness. And for me that's just an unbelievably mind-shifting thought. Because for most of us, when we see the thing we fear is death, isn't it? Just say this, I'm going to start to explain why it's like that psychologically, and then we'll be here till four o'clock or something. But there are, but that would be no fear, isn't it, when we see? Thank you. And now I can go on. Um, so, 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 our narrative, the stuff that's playing on, in, that's the tune that's playing inside of us is one of, I feel this because it could be dead. Jesus said, sickness now, when you embrace it, is one about the possibility of life. And that's a different way of looking at sickness. It's also interesting to say, just, that we don't know who those four friends were. And it's unlikely that they were perfect saints. They certainly weren't any of the disciples. They were probably flawed men and women, probably men. They were probably flawed people like you and I. Carrying our own difficulties with our managers, with our commitments, with our finances, uh, came all of that stuff, but yet they had the faith to bring somebody to Jesus, notwithstanding their own situation. And so I just want to say to you today, I want to say to myself too, that don't allow your suffering to be yours only. Sometimes our suffering, our brokenness, our imperfections can also be an invitation to minister to others. And in that way, God works in us too. I was talking to a couple the other day, um, and they managed to in a very rough, rocky place. But somebody else came to them with a marriage problem. And their first initial reaction was, I can't deal with this, our own marriage is in a mess. But they didn't say no. They listened and answered to God. And as they ministered in their brokenness to the other couple, their own marriage was blessed and healed. And sometimes you've got to take our sickness and say, I don't know what to do about this. But as I allow it to speak into somebody else's a blessing flows. Okay, let me make the last one. Um, and, um, um, the story ends, and it's the first time in the gospel that we hear this. The story ends with saying, and everybody praised thee. It's an incredible thought. Why did everybody praise him? Because the witness of the sick man and his four friends gave glory.
glory to God. So the point is, how we deal with our sickness, how available we are to minister to those who are sick, how available we are to care, how available we are to help, is ultimately what allows other people to see the work of God taking place and give glory to God. So how you deal with your sickness, how you deal with old age, in my case not very well, um, uh, how we deal with those around us who are sick, that is the stuff of which praise will be given to God. It is your public witness to a broken, aching, hard world about what God is doing and how God is at work in you. <clears throat> Don't let your sickness not allow you. Rather, let your sickness allow you to give glory to God by the way you deal with it. Amen. 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 Let's just be silent for a moment.